Yeah. We're a few minutes late, which goes against the only religion I have, which is punctuality. Um, Thank you very much. Uh, I, I'm Mike Jennings, and uh, I, most of you probably know that I have the honour of being the current chair of TASC. Uh, I keep reminding myself it's a current thing because I don't ever take it for granted. It is really an honour. I'm very proud of it. And I think the fact that you're here tonight probably indicates that you know something about TASC and what it is that we stand for and what it is that we do. I was asked to uh, say just a few words to a welcome and introduction. Um, I explained that I don't normally use a mic, I'm a mic enough myself, um, but the item has been recorded, so the compromise is that I'd stand here so I might be able to pick up. But the worst that can happen is that my words of wisdom will be lost to posterity, and I think we can probably deal with that. Right? So I just want to really welcome you, and I want to note in particular uh, the joy it is for me, and I hope for you, that we're actually meeting together in a room where we can actually touch, even if it's only elbow to elbow. Now, I know that we've had apologies from some people who, for various reasons, felt that it was uh, ill-advised uh, to come, which obviously we completely respect and understand in whatever circumstances it lies. But it is very, very good of you to come here, very good of you to participate. And you know the old thing about you wait for a bus and then three of them come along. We actually had an event, uh, uh, in-person event, on Tuesday, uh, on Sunday night in TU Dublin, which was the first time we were able to get together. And then we have another event tomorrow, which is the board meeting of TASC, which is the first board meeting that we would have had in person since the pandemic began. So it's kind of a feeling that we're on, on, on a roll to, to, to some degree. So I'm very, very pleased about that. And um, I, I have the duty to introduce only one person, and that person then will do the rest of the introductions. So uh, you're probably delighted with that because you've already noticed how I can make a meal out of even the most short little slap that I've given. given. So I'm very pleased that uh, the event this evening is going to be chaired by TASC's own Susie Khan. And Susie is our project coordinator on the Climate Justice uh, Centre uh, of TASC. And she has been delivering on the People's Transition Project. You may have seen some very good um, press with regard to the transition project uh, based in Finsborough here in Dublin and Ardorat in, in County Donegal. And Susie has been working um, centrally on that for the last seven months. Uh, Susie has a, a background in the arts, which makes her particularly appropriate to chair an evening such as this. She studied sculpture in Limerick Art College in the 1980s and went on to achieve a master's in art therapy in New York in 1991. Uh, she pioneered community art and creative art therapies for over 35 years in various marginalised communities and mental health settings. Uh, she co-founded Karik Dulra, which I understand translates as the Rock of Nature, is that right, Karik Dulra? Brother Linus would be proud of me that I remembered something. Uh, a regenerative education focused on social enterprise. She was co-founder and writer with the Wicklow Writers Group and her current creative uh, output is uh, to do with, uh, it's a podcast of eight distinct uh, interwoven threads. So uh, I'm very pleased that uh, Susie has agreed to be chair and I will hand over and can I just interject if I may just to say one thing, can I thank Roddy especially because I know Roddy is a big football fan. <laughs> the fact that he turned up tonight despite the fact that there's a certain uh, football match taking place this evening. I didn't but, know at the but, time. But, but, <laughs> I just want to warn you, please don't say anything that can give him the excuse to walk out in the hall. <laughs> it will be an inventive excuse because we know he's somewhere else to go. So, Roddy, thank you very much for coming around. Now, I could be being sexist about it, and our other two panelists could be even more dedicated uh, football supporters. I don't know that. I'm not assuming that's because they're women or that. It's just that I know Roddy is. So, Susie. I promise I'll stop now and hand over to you. Thank you very much, and thank you all for coming. Please. So, yeah, welcome everybody, and particularly welcome.
welcome to our um, panel tonight. Um, Roddy told me not to introduce him, um, so I'm now about to risk offending him and send him off to the football. <laughs> I almost wanted to say, could we get people to call out the names of Roddy's books from the audience? Because I reckon that that would actually introduce you um, pretty well, because I think that they're incredibly well known. Um, you're the author of 12 novels. I uh, didn't know a few of them, so now there's a couple that I need to pick up, but The Commitments and The Snapper and Paddy Clark, ha ha ha, um, that you won the Booker Prize and The Woman Who Walked Into Doors, and most recently Love. And then your collections of short stories, books for children, and the Two Pints series, and the memoir of your parents, Rory and Vita. So you've also written the screenplay for The Commitments, and you've been the co-founder and chair of Fighting Words include Bloodroot and the Poison Glen. She's a recipient of the Next Generation Artist Award from the Irish Arts Council and a co-recipient of the Markovich Award. Henry is a, a former literary fellow of Acad Academie Schloss Solitude in Germany and former artist in residence at the Jacques Cure House Orlando. So you've been <laughs> busy, Henry, since you and I worked together many years ago in some creative arts therapies. Um, but just to give a little sense of the re the reviews that Henry has been getting, the Los Angeles Review of Books says, Nikuran can condense the prototypical life of a young Irish woman into half a page while sustaining the poem's impact. It's a testament to her ability as a storyteller, the vividness of her language, and the universality of the portraits she's painting. And back a bit nearer to home, the Irish Times said, with your musicality and sensuousness, as well as the fearlessness, it marks a welcome fresh appearance of a vivid new voice. And then we have Fiona. Fiona Whelan is a Dublin-based artist, writer and lecturer in NCID, and she's the current resident artist in IMA. Um, her practice is committed to exploring and responding to systemic power relations, most specifically those as they relate to class and gender inequality. You can see how everybody here on this panel is fitting well with the task. Um, she has a strong commitment to long-term cross-sectoral collaborations. Since 2004, she's worked closely with the Rialto Youth Project on a series of durational projects exploring the lived experiences of those systemic inequalities with young people. And currently you're working on two projects, What Does He Need, the Rialto Youth Project and Broken Talkers, and a multi-story creative engagement for housing change. Incredibly pertinent places you're showing up in. Um, her writing focuses on the complex relationality, labour and ethical challenges of collaborative arts projects and practice. And as an educator, you're committed to the professional development of artists with participatory and collaborative practices in mind, teaching at undergraduate and postgrad in NCAD. And you received your PhD in 2019 um, at the Centre for Socially Engaged Practice-Based Research in TU Dublin, where we were on Sunday with the President. Um, so just to frame our discussion tonight a little bit and, and get us going Susie, in. Yeah, sorry, and this is off and on. This Can't is hear not, me? It, no, no, that's not, this is not a joke, right? It's on this, uh, this guy coming up and saying, I was given one thing that was mandatory for me to say, and it's the one thing I didn't say, typically. You know, Mike Jenny doesn't follow a script. But we're actually not only socially, but legally obliged just to tell you about the, the fire alarm. In the event that the fire alarm does go off, you should leave through the entrance that you came in and make your way to the main door and then wait outside and we will do a count. So sorry about that, uh, but it would be completely remiss of me not to have done that. Typically, by telling you, you ask him to do something, he does everything bad, the thing he's asked to do. And just to say, with regards to the masks, if you, you're free to wear them when you're sitting, obviously, which is good, but certainly, will you please keep them on when you're moving around? except when you're drinking the wine, because it's difficult. But, uh, so I'm very, very sorry, Susie. What am I like? Thank you. So in the context of what we want to talk about, the arts and social change this evening, one of the things I was thinking about is, um, as I was 
forming my thoughts at the beginning of this conversation is about um, Rob Hopkins, who's the founder, co-founder of the Transition Towns Movement, has started, uh, he wrote a book um, a couple of years ago now called What If, and he's got a podcast called What If, and he said that he got into that in looking at the transitions that we need to make, the, all of the critical um, convergent crises that we face, because he heard Naomi Klein and George Monbiot and people like that saying that what we had was a failure of imagination, a failure to imagine a different system that would not be as oppressive as it is to marginal peoples. It would not um, be creating the environmental uh, degradation that it's done. And I just wanted to start with that really about that idea that arts and imagination are obviously critically intertwined and I wondered if you, any of you would like to respond um, just about the collaborations that you're seeing and the, the potential for a political aspect or a engaged activism aspect in that and whether you think it has a role in social change. Roddy, we might start with you. Is that working? Yes. And I don't know how to respond exactly. I work alone. Uh, so collaboration isn't the first thought in my head. And a lot of us do that. The problem, I think, I was thinking about it, you know, the future, going ahead after gradually we're allowed to do what we're doing at the moment, mingle, start working together. And I think as a group of artists, what we're not very good at is representing ourselves, defining ourselves. Sport, it's easier with sport, I think, because it's more precise. And that's why I think sport was opened up much sooner than our places were opened up. And I don't know how we can begin to represent ourselves, because I'm sure what the four of us do, the, probably the differences are more significant than the similarities other than the fact that we're artists. But um, I think as a group, and I don't mean this personally, but I do mean it, and I, I don't want to be over sentimental with the verb I choose, but we've suffered because of that. Uh, and as artists as well, I think we're too ready to hand over uh, our selves to administrators and we don't get the language of what we do across. I think what I'm trying to say is that it's very hard to explain to people what you do for a living. I don't know how many times I've been told, you must have had great fun writing that. And I didn't. It's fucking terrible writing that. You know, trying to write a good page of dialogue is, you know, it's, it's difficult. I love it. I mean, I'm not you know, I'm not saying it's torture and, you know, God love me, but I think there's a there's a, a tendency to think that it must be effortless somehow and that we float around and we, you know, we meet each other and um, we paint a little bit and we dabble and, you know, but we don't actually work. It's not labour. I, I was thinking about the past a good deal recently because I think it was so much easier to get across the point that you're working when there was an electric typewriter. Padoom, 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 padoom. It was almost like the sound of a building site, you know? And um, so I think that's one thing as, a, as, a, as an artist, leaving aside what we write about or what we, you know, try to represent on canvas or on the stage or whatever, is that I don't know how to achieve it, but it is a big challenge to try and represent ourselves, to try and get across that we are workers, you know? We're not just fluting around, we are workers. And, you know, I had a, a play uh, postponed two years because of this. I wrote it alone in a room, but as a cast of 16, and you could start doing the sums then, the design people, the carpenters, the whole. It wasn't just me who was postponed, so to speak. It was maybe 50 people. And that's labor, that's work. And um, we didn't manage to get that across. And, um, I, I think, you know, it would be, you know, it would be an achievement to try and do that, to plant ourselves as artists 
in the center of the working life, you know. I was also thinking, and I don't know of the might or whatever, but it's in my head, um, in the 80s when I was starting out, uh, there were more venues in Dublin. It's ironic, but there were more venues. There were more unofficial venues where you could stage a play. Uh, my first play was on in the SFX Centre on just off Gardner Street. It's not there anymore. There's so many other venues that are gone. They're not there anymore. Uh, looking around, walking around Dublin quite a lot recently. There's a lot of empty space. There's a lot of empty... M me, as a 63-year-old man, looks in a window and sees an empty shop. Me, as a 27-year-old man, would have looked in the window and seen we could put on a play in there. And I think we need to start looking at the, you know, what there is out there to free it up and to, if possible, to get young people, I don't want to sound patronising, but into those spaces and bring them alive. In the same way that Temple Bar, despite the fact that the plan was in the 80s, I think, or certainly in the 70s, to convert it into a bus depot, there were people using it as a studio space and it was, there was a great buzz around the place, even though it was supposed to be derelict and on its knees. There was a great, great creative buzz there. And the other thing, uh, when I started uh, working in the arts, I was a teacher, so I had a job. I didn't have to worry about where the money was coming from. Brendan Gleeson was on my first play, and Brendan, like myself, was a teacher. Some of the other actors had this great thing, which was called the dole. And at that time, you could get a bed sit, you could feed yourself and have enough left for a few pints. You could actually spend a time of your life finding out exactly what sort of an actor you wanted to be, or a writer you wanted to be, or an artist you wanted to be. In retrospect, it was very benign. You can't do that anymore. And, it's, and the arts are being closed off to, as we know, a whole class of people. Because if they don't get the help from the mammy and the daddy, it's the same with bloody mortgages and stuff like that. If you don't come from a particular class, it's going to be shut down to you. So I think if we're going to try and replicate, and I think it would be brilliant, if we're going to try to replicate what happened after World War I and the Spanish flu with the Roaring Twenties, I think we have to open everything. The, uh, artists should not have to fill in grant forms. You know, you're, if, you're, if you're applying to write a novel, you have to give a synopsis of the novel. That is not how it works. I've never known how a novel is going to go when I started. Luckily, I've never had to apply for a grant. So you have to trust the artist and just, in a way, it's money, fling it at them. Fling it at them and don't expect an immediate return. I hope, I'm sorry, I've been talking a lot, but I've probably said as much as I want to say all night. But they, they, these were just the thoughts that were in my head. Thanks, Mike. Fiona, do you think in terms of the marginalised young people today, that they have access and are we reaching in the arts? Um, in short, I would say no. Um, but I suppose, I can't speak specifically for Writing Words or any organisation, but I suppose, um, yeah, I mean, I think we have a kind of history in the arts around um, outreach is a term that gets used a lot. And it's sort of like when a, a quite powerful institution decides to bring others in, but it often and it aligns with the kind of ethics of social inclusion, which we don't always look at what the person's being invited to be included into and what's wrong with that system. So I think there are really, there have been interesting um, examples of all kinds of things where people have been invited in, but the, a lot of the systems that they're invited into are still largely kind of, you know, dominant white middle class institutions. So, um, I mean, I come from a field of practice that where we, I rarely work alone. So apart from when I'm writing, everything else is typically collaborative. Um, and so, I mean, in Ireland, there's a thriving collaborative arts, socially engaged arts field. And just in case people don't know what that is, it, you know, typically artists um, across all art forms would engage in social and political themes, but usually they would work with people to make the work in response to those issues and themes and explorations. So, like, I, I'm working on a project with housing activists, or I'm working on another project with youth workers and young people. And so we're in around those, and, and of course, in that sector, there's quite a lot of thinking at the moment in terms of um, rather than, I suppose, the history of it was an artist would go and work with the community or the other kind of marginalised groups. Whereas I think now there's a shift and we have a, a brilliant national agency called CREATE, um, an agency for collaborative artists, who are now running a lot of programmes, you know, looking at cultural diversity and ethnic minorities and trying to support artists from diverse backgrounds, you know. And there are there are programmes and institutions. I think it is it is shifting. I see it in NCAD and other places. 
but it's a long way to go and it needs a proper examination of you know institutions need to be willing to look at themselves and see what are we really doing like what you know look at the makeup of the board the makeup of the panel and really you know think about yeah you know, what we really mean when we say equality and access yeah great and we um you know we've got the the some supports like Roddy was talking about there are grants there are supports um do you think there's enough in place for artists who rely on these kinds of things for um, income and what kind of support would change so a little bit you know like we're talking about what kinds of supports if people can't apply for grants or can't access do you think would help give uh, other voices uh, a space in this it's a huge question you know what needs to happen in ireland to further support artists and i think roddy has touched on some of that and fiona as well i mean just kind of looking at the bigger picture, I think a greater awareness of the importance of the arts in Ireland. And I know we're very good culturally at uh, valuing the arts, but we could be better in terms of recognising the role they have to play across every part of society. So I've worked in prisons, in healthcare settings, in schools. There's nowhere in my mind that an artist or a writer can't fit in and use their their versatile skills in some way to work with the communities. And you know, I was thinking a lot um, of the poetic tradition that I come out of recently during lockdown with a lot of time on my hands, thinking about the tradition, the Gaelic tradition that I come out of. You know, it said that the first poem said in Ireland was the songs of Amergan. And Amergan was this mythical bard who came onto the west coast of Ireland, onto Kerry, and put a foot on the land and declared this spellbinding manifesto in which he summoned the natural world and the environment and made these kind of declarations. I am wind on sea. I am the waves. I am the seven stags. And so there's something for me about the arts as a place to understand our interconnectedness with things, with environment, with community, uh, with where we fit into the picture. And that's written there in our earliest texts. You know, the artist or the writer has been that bridge between things like body and landscape or between language and landscape. And so my takeaway really from thinking about all of this in lockdown is that the arts has a role in showing us how connected we are to each other and that that gets lost sometimes in our society because we look to the arts as entertainment or pleasure or and of course you know poetry can be for celebration and for praise but it's also for interrogation it's for questioning, it's for discomforting each other, and it's for understanding our place in the picture. You know, Joan Didion said, we tell ourselves stories in order to live. You know, and as a society, we really need to keep our eye on the ball. If we don't fund the arts, if we don't keep that sense of rootedness and interconnectedness and spaces, and as Roddy said, platforms and venues and infrastructure for that, then I think we're kind of flying without wings, you know. Then we lose our relationship with environment and landscape and language and all of these important things. And maybe we might go back to the thing you said at the beginning, Roddy, about working alone. Because you're talking about working alone and yet you're giving voice in your writing to something particular and even, you know, to talk about class, to talk about the particular characters, the particular stories. That you choose to say so like Anne Marie's talking about that you're giving voice to something in particular um, and and so it goes back to like that purpose of the arts or that purpose of the writing or that drive to do that um, do you think that that is something that is came to the fore I know that a lot of people have had access to the arts and to other new voices and different plays online and all sorts of things like the the, the online venue when you translate your voice into the, the new media or when it comes out to different people, do you think it's still saying the same stories? Is it that, um, is it something different? Uh, the honest answer, 
<laughs> I don't know. Uh, I do know from uh, from my involvement in finding Morris, because there was a life before the pandemic, uh, that the, to my eye and to my ear and to my, uh, from my experience of reading words on a page since as a child, the more, some of the most interesting writings coming from uh, writers who are speaking English but may well be speaking a different language at home. Uh, for whatever, the hyphenated Irish. I don't know, I don't want to offend anybody. The new Irish, Irish people who also have another heritage. And you know, it's not, we're no strangers to that because we speak English in a way that's quite distinct and nobody else in the world speaks English the way we do. And I'm after saying that because <laughs> Nobody else in the world says, I'm after doing this or I'm after doing that. It's, you know, direct translation. And um, it's brilliant. You know, it's absolutely brilliant. And uh, looking around at children and teenagers, often would say East European surnames or African surnames, and you're looking at what they're doing, and they're bringing in different types of characters, and there's an elbow to their grammar, an extra elbow, so to speak, that maybe me, I don't have because of my age and because of the way I grew up. And it's really, really exciting. Um, unlike a footballer who can be discovered at the age of 16, uh, writers often don't get seen that quickly. They often wouldn't have a clue what they're doing at that age. Uh, I was messing around for half a decade before something clicked and I began to write the book that became The Commitments. So. With Fighting Words, I think, and with other organisations, what we're doing is kind of giving them the opportunity to, to, to express themselves freely. And one of the things that chokes that is the education system. Um, it would be such a brilliant thing if we could just kill the leaving cert. If that happened in my lifetime, I mean, I never thought there'd be same-sex marriage in my lifetime. I didn't think there'd be abortion in my lifetime. I didn't think you'd no longer be a freak of nature to declare yourself an atheist in Ireland in my lifetime, so I got all them wrong. Uh, but I can't see it happening because it's so tied in with the economic structure of this country, but it chokes creativity, the leaving cert. And what was one of the little revelations during the first year of the lockdown is that the education system continued without the leaving cert. And the possibility was open there that you can actually assess the different intelligences of young people without them having to endure this horrible, horrible, uh, I don't know what to call it, without being offensive, but, you know. And if you could even just give it a different name and work backwards and start genuinely cherishing and appreciating creativity. One of my children was discouraged from writing a short story in the leaving cert because they're not easy to mark. <laughs> do the essay because it's easier to mark and the teachers quite rightly are encouraging the kids to get as much points as possible and then you're thinking well is that the whole purpose of education to accumulate points so that a small group of people will end up needing them and at the moment that is the case one of the people at the CAO at the end you know when they even said results were being handed out you know is there anywhere else in the world where it's the first item on the news and uh, I kind of, he must be close to retirement, and I don't know who he was, whether he was the boss or whether he was the second in command or whatever. He said, the sooner we get back to the leaving cert, the better. And I gasped, I literally did gasp when I heard it, because I think the, over, the overwhelming lesson is that it's the other way around. Use, that, use what that glimpse that we saw to make it this a better future for our writers, our, our, our artists, that generation that's coming up, generations who haven't been born yet, we dine out as a country on our artistic life. I mean, I, I'm doing an online event in uh, the United States early next year. First question, can the ambassador say a few words? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> That's not why I do this. Stuff. It's not, so there, you know, and I'm not being, I don't want to be dismissive of the country or the state or anything like that. I love living here. But we dine out on the arts and it's about time we actually thought about what that means. It's not just messing around with paint 
and you know, finding a word that rhymes with another word. It has to be part of who we are. And I think a lot of us have become artists despite the state. I mean, that's Christian Bill, it's Brown. I mean, it may well be that everybody was encouraging. If the Christian brothers had been saying nice to me and things to me, I wouldn't be here today. I'm not for a minute advocating that we get bring in the Christian brothers again, you know. But so the, the, getting the balance right is um, is important. But I think it's it's just vital that we start actually allowing ourselves to think in that way. You know, the leaving cert, house prices, all this stuff, it's measurable. It's all about points, money, and it's owned by a small class of people and they're determined to hold on to it. And I think it'd be a great thing just to rest control. Some of us will remember hearing the fury of school principals whose students are they they didn't get the points that they were entitled to. And other schools, the sheer joy of other students from areas that generally weren't included in the celebrations. And this was seen as bad, you know, whereas most of us here in the room would have thought it was wonderful. And it, it's a glimpse of an opportunity. Um, and I don't know if that made sense, but. To either Fiona or to Henry, I, I'm wondering about the emerging artists that you're also seeing, that you, you know, as a emerging artist yourself, Henry, you know, but also are there people that you see getting to have um, a say that, that actually does say something about inequality, that does say, you know, that is speaking from that place and is, uh, do you think that has, um, is that going to have an influence? So the, the kind of what Roddy was talking about, the people with a different uh, last name than um, the traditional Irish names that we know, and the people that are, are coming from other voices and, and maybe writing or speaking or, or creating art through media that don't even use language. Do you think there are emerging things that shift the whole sense of what Irish art is saying in the world, like either here at home or when it speaks elsewhere, has it that potential to speak about equality, speak about inequality? Fiona probably has more to say to this subject now than, than I have, but just um, kind of nodding my head as Roddy is talking there about the new communities coming in, because one of the things I feel really excited about in the workshops that I run is that not only are these young writers coming in with a totally different experience of language sometimes and they're rejuvenating the English language in Ireland but it's waking up Irish born people to their language and to their roots so suddenly everyone in the room sits up and starts thinking about language roots so I'm also seeing a huge rejuvenation in um, people who want to uh, learn from Irish language poets and look at the Irish poetic uh, tradition um, I suppose, you know, we're at this interesting point in Irish history because we've had two referen referenda, am I right? Plural of referendums. <laughs> um, we've had Waking the Feminists, we've had the Me Too movement. I think, and you could maybe argue this out of me, but I think we're at this era where there's a lot of airing of trauma and there's a lot of wrestling with language and art spaces and how can we bear witness to changes of, say, the last five, ten years? And certainly as a poet, how can I find a form and a language? And how can I work with those kind of subjects ethically and sensitively? So I think we're into a new era now of writing about trauma. And in poetry, you're seeing much more visibility of female voices, much more so than... 10 years. I mean, you might all remember the tea towel with the Irish writers, you know, and not, was there, was there a single woman on it? I think there was one woman on it. <laughs> oh, no, no, I'm just, I'm just, I'm asking for, uh, you know, I don't have the facts in front of me. Sorry, I'm not. <laughs> but, um, you know, that whole landscape of um, literature and writing and what gets written about, it's kind of, I get the sense it's kind of shifted a bit. So now you have female voices coming to the fore 
bearing witness to things like institutional legacies. I mean, I'm very interested in writing about mother and baby homes histories. Not that these things weren't written about before, but they might not have been anthologized. They might not have been programmed at festivals. So I don't know, it's, I might be way off the mark, but that's my kind of sense of emerging writers and emerging topics, Fiona. Yeah, okay. Am I on yet? I, uh, maybe I can pick up a little on that as well. Um, I think, like, if I think back to my own primary degree as an artist, it was all about being taught to be an individual, to think of the world as an individual and work alone and have a sort of what we call in visualize a signature practice. And so for me, there was definitely a sense of unlearning some of that and realizing there was a world and I could connect and things could come from connections. And so there's a, I definitely see now an emergence of collective practice and a lot of, you know, we see people working in all kinds of different ways. I'm just picking up on Roddy's point earlier. I think there's a real issue in, in the arts in terms of arts funding and the infrastructures around the arts. There's really short term funding streams and, you know, anyone who engages with community groups or, you know, with uh, you know civil society issues typically you need to be around for a good bit of time mm -hmm. you know to build relationships and, and spaces and understandings and so the arts are, are like the arts funding is almost one of the inhibiting factors you know and I see myself having what I call a durational practice alongside certain <coughs> issues and, and spaces so you're up against that structure and then also the expectation to know what everything will be so like you said, in terms of your, you know, describing the novel in advance, like what I ch cherish as an artist is that I don't know. And that's my primary position going into any room is I don't know and I, I'm okay with that. And we'll figure it out and I'll figure it out. But it's, you know, when you're, the infrastructure is often you're expected to know and you're expected to do it in a certain amount of time. So I think there's that structure, but then we see different ways that people are kind of resisting that and, and really interesting kind of practices emerging. I know in my field there's, there's a real rich um, kind of breadth of art practitioners engaging with all kinds of social, political issues, racial issues, you know, diversity issues, and you know, really putting some of those to the fore. And a lot of artists are really aligning with activism. I mean, you've mentioned that some of the referendum, like the artists' campaign to repeal the eighth, was quite strong. And you know, so artists putting themselves, not making work about a social issue, but actually putting themselves into the politics of the issue and adding value to that. So for me, that's kind of the exciting. Yeah, I suppose like Joe, Joe Castlin's same sex love mural that featured during um, the same sex marriage referendum. But so that is, it touches there on, on arts and, you know, a core to task's mission is, um, you know, the preservation of democracy <laughs> and the, you know, the inclusion, inclusive democracy, participatory democracy. Do you think that, you know, that, and maybe continuing on, Fiona, with you first, the, the, that role of the artist, you know, and those expressing has has a function in, in promoting that in being an activist for democratic, you know, um, structures. Yeah, I, I really do. I believe like the, the the sort of idea of the artist as being this reclusive outside of society <coughs> person. Um, you know, and I'm not saying that artists all need to work collaboratively, but we're in the world as people, like everybody else. So. I think there's a sort of a myth about where artists float around, you know, and do something else. So, absolutely, uh, many social issues affect artists like they affect anyone else. So, I think there is absolutely a place. Uh, I suppose for me, it's like it's about artists trying to align themselves with existing structures and cross sector, seeing what else is happening and what where they could add value, but always with the caveat of not wanting to be instrumentalized, because I think the big fear for artists is that they will become kind of, you know. Yeah, instrumentalized is the only word I can think of for it, where you start to become, yeah, formulaic and then it starts to kill the thing. So, you know, I, for me, I suppose, I, I feel like I managed to sustain such a long term relationship with Royalty Project because they always left me to be an artist in that space. I was never kind of turned into or sort of urged to be a youth arts worker or kind of a particular arts educator. It was like, no, be an artist and be around us as an organization and let's see what that looks like. You know, and that's down to the vision of some of the people there but i think artists are open for those kind of invitations like you say there's kind of nowhere an artist can't go as long as the invitation is is kind of particular i suppose yeah kind of same question to to both work for, to, to either of you Andrea or Roddy, about arts and and its function in democracy and um, i think it's important that we don't tell an artist what they should be or what they should do mm -hmm. um 
I, uh, you know, that's one of the important things that they shouldn't, um, shouldn't be the first thought when they wake up in the morning, you know, what would I do for democracy today? Uh, but in, my, in a way, uh, inevitably, if you're expressing yourself artistically, uh, you are going to rub up against people who will want to shut you up somehow or other, either because they don't think it has, has any value, value attached to it, therefore it's a waste of money and could be spent on something uh, more purposeful, or they don't want to hear what you're saying, you're writing or you're presenting on paper. And I've had that experience, that strange privilege, luckily, um, I wrote a television series called Family that was broadcast in 1994, and uh, it, it caused a, you know, a bit of a ruckus, and I got death threats, um, all sorts of hostility. And um, uh, when that happens, you know, luckily it was before email or social media or anything like that. But when you open an envelope in the morning and you see that somebody said you're dead. Uh, it does give um, it does give you pause for thought, and it does uh, make you think. Um, well, I'm glad I actually live in a place where um, I'm al I'm allowed to say what I said in that series. It was about a um, a woman uh, in a very very bad violent marriage, and there were those that didn't want me to say that. And at times have changed somewhat, but there are other topics that people do not want to address. They don't want, you know. Um, so, I think, um, yeah, I think it's uh, of necessity, if you are an artist, it seems to me you have to be some sort of a democrat. It's free speech, and it, it's not free speech as owned by some people. But there's other thing, there's one thing I want to say as well about, you know, I think a good novel is full of the little moments. So if we have, for example, as we do in Fighting Words, a young, uh, young woman, and I talk from direct experience because I saw her working some years ago. And it was absolutely, what she was writing was absolutely brilliant. And her background is Polish, lives in Finland, background is Polish. And she's writing about what we in, in Ireland call having your dinner. But it's a different experience. And her writing was glorious because she was writing about that little moment in the house, a little domestic moment. It wasn't a big uh, political topic, you know, but she was writing about that and in English, so it's becoming an Irish moment, if that makes sense. And the little moments and the little details and the little bits of grammar that these writers are bringing. And I keep saying writers, but that's, that's, the, that's the only word I know. But when it goes up on a canvas or it's in a film as well, these, these new interpretations, these new little chipping away at old definitions and you know an expansion of new definitions. I remember when Klansky set out that Donald Lunny was being condemned because he played uh, the bazooka, the bazooka, which wasn't an Irish instrument, and there were whole debates about whether the guitar was a traditional Irish instrument. When I wrote the commitments, and suddenly Mustang Sally became a traditional Irish song, <laughs> <laughs> you know? and it's brilliant when this sort of stuff happens. And uh, you know, so it's little moments. It's not just uh, you know, because a novel is full of little moments. That's why it's a novel in many ways. And these are new little moments. And we have to, there was a time 10 years ago, 20 years ago, a comedian would go on stage and start talking about the immersion in Tato Crisps, and wasn't it absolutely hilarious? If any, you know, comedian goes up on stage and starts making jokes about the immersion in Tato Crisps and the mammy and the tea, it's so dated and awful now, it's so confined, it's almost, it's almost fascistic. I don't want to insult anybody who tells jokes about immersions. But it, you, you kind of like an artist, you get up and you look around and you look left and right and you, your ears are attuned and you're taking it all in. And I'm doing that still. And what we need to make sure is that 16 year olds, the 6 year olds, the 26 year olds, uh, everybody in the island has the opportunity to be that artist. Yeah. And Ray, I was thinking about um, our first connection was in a creative arts therapy space. and. Those little moments that Roddy's talking about, like through the through the past trauma that you've been tapping into or talk, talking about, that artists are talking about, that you've been writing about, those little moments have been a lot about um, the expression of particular emotions. And I think, you know, over the last couple of years, obviously, there's been, you know, I'm very aware of the young people in my life and their need to express the emotion of what it's been like for them to live through a pandemic, what it's been like to step out into the world 
at that very moment where they're supposed to be fearless and think that they can go do it all and then something goes actually that's a very different world now and I, I know from you know some of your poems about that that juxtaposition of past experiences like in the poem where you reference the foster sisters that you had and then the you know that was a little moment but it, it really expresses a lot of emotion um what do you think about that as a, i suppose a part of health and well-being um that that the being able to talk about our own personal little moments in some way or our emotions in some way through the arts though those little moments are everything because you know Ivan Boland had this lovely saying poetry begins where certainty ends and um, I think uh, Roddy has touched upon that as well as an artist or a writer when you set out on the journey to make something you can't know where you're going for me the measure of a poem that is working is when I end up somewhere completely unexpected I've been taken by surprise, I've, I've embarrassed myself, I've revealed myself, but something unexpected has happened. And, you know, you, you talk, your initial question was, I think, about activism and the arts and can an artist be an activist? And I think there's a natural overlap there between the artist who wants to drive a piece of work into the world. That is a political act. You know, you're taking a stance. So there's a natural overlap with activists who want to push forward an agenda. But I would say as well that an artist is not an activist exactly. You know, there they can be complementary roles. And you know, you could see that in things like um well, Waking the Feminists or Me Too or the campaign to reveal the eighth or the nineteen sixteen rising, you know, as problematic as that is. But the people who went out were actors, writers, musicians. So they were dreamers. And an artist or a writer is a dreamer. And sure, of course, activism can benefit from dreaming. But you must also have retained that right to take the work wherever it needs to go. And sometimes it'll go to completely uncomfortable or unpopular places. And you don't really have control over that. Like I said, I read my first book and I thought it was going to be about uh, landscape and the beauty of Northwest Donegal and Herblore and folklore. And you know, three years in, I was sitting at Anne Lovett's grave. I was down in Carsevine thinking about Joanne Hayes. And I was thinking, how did this happen? How did I end up down this road writing about women's lives in 1984? <laughs> you know, and I thought it won't be of it. It won't be of interest to anyone, but I have to keep going with it, you know. And I suppose the book did come at a time where it ended up being of interest. But I guess the point is that unexpectedness has to be protected within arts. Um, and then going back to just what you're saying about young young people and can it be a way of allowing a young person to have little moments along the way of their development or growth? Absolutely. Absolutely, it should be such a huge part of our, uh, you know, our, our kind of reshaped education system. Can I, can I just pick, add something to that? I've been part of a project the last couple of years called What Does He Need? Um, which looks at how boys and young men are shaped by the world they live in and how they in turn shape the world they live in. So we've developed this creative method where we bring together a group of boys or young men to create a boy and then they have to say, what his life's going to be like. I mean, essentially, they're writing him into existence, what he's up against, what he'll encounter, how he should deal with that. And it's very much those little moments, the, the you know, all those little daily moments. So some of these processes, you know, are are, are, are so simple in some ways, but they're so revealing in, some, in another way. And it just takes me back to your first question around the imaginary, because I think we're, we're talking about creating, you know, fiction, you know, making up things, essentially. But as well as them being imaginative in that playful sense of being imaginative, there's something in the kind of social imagination of, you know, for, for me it's like creating new characters with young people. And then sometimes the character gets to do something the child themselves can't do, you know, but collectively exploring the potential of that character. You can almost, you know, the arts have a way of bringing things into existence before perhaps they're socially able to be brought into existence. And, you know, and that can be a kind of, you know, the, that imaginary can be, Quite radical, actually, even though it's quite simple in another way. I mean, in essence, you're kind of starting to talk about vision and visionary 
you know, because if you're imagining something that doesn't exist, which is what I was talking about at the beginning, the, the changes to the to the system we live in and whether we can, you know, if imagination of young people aren't supported in both expressing the little moments or aren't being able to create a character the way you've just described, um, how can we imagine that there is an alternative to, you know, any system? Um, and and I, I think the other piece that you're all been talking about is actually the, what I, the word edgy <laughs> keeps coming up to me, you know, because you're going into edges that are not comfortable as artists and you're willing to go into those edgy places and see what might emerge out of that in, in a nature sense and really you know the the edge in uh, any ecosystem is the most fertile place you know because if there's a river delta going into the sea it's got it's got all the diversity in the edge you know you've got the the river creatures and the sea creatures and then the ones adapted to live within do you think that that edginess is is a, a kind of a tonic to the you know the, the homogenization you mentioned film creation creation and I certainly know a lot of young people being able to access a film on their phone create stuff that way generate you know when you think of the little instamatics that I grew up with the idea that they can access the level of you know technology to compete with the Hollywood dominance or the you know these kind of more not edgy, <laughs> no longer edgy creations. Um, is that a piece of it, of kind of going to the edges and finding the diversity? Well, just even as you're saying edges there and moving your readers or your artists into an uncomfortable space, like I remember the first time I read one of Roddy's books being a teenager and thinking, oh my gosh, you know, it's a part of society that I see my, these are narratives that I see myself as a rural working class also reflected in. Um, I mean, art for me is the antidote to pa patriarchy, to capitalism. You know, it's it gives me a space, and I'm not saying it's the same for everyone else, but it gives me a space to reconnect with that divine feminine of pre Christian, pre-patriarchy, you know, it pre-colonization, pre -colonization, absolutely, and it's something I'm thinking a lot more about is this post-colonial wound and how, you know, all, everything that's happening in Ireland at the moment and all the hurts and the violence against women and the, the male violence and the direct provision and, you know, all these legacies of institutions, I mean, it's all happening in this post-colonial hurt. And so poetry gives me a way of exploring all of that in a way that I don't really get an opportunity to do in other parts of my life. So it's a, it's a safe space for that. Yeah. yeah. Maybe that would be, we're going to come to an end, but maybe that would be a place to go at the end is that, you know, we're living on a shared island. We have that history that you're referring to. And we're talking about reaching across divides, you know, to, into, um, you know places of community where where we didn't understand each other we didn't we don't you know uh, do you see a role like in a post brexit world do you see a role for that kind of finding what we have in common as well as the differences that we've been talking about Roddy do you want to I don't think that'll ever be a thought when I'm sitting down to write I, I don't think no I think again uh, I think of the book I wrote, The Woman Who Walked Into Doors. A man pulls back his fist and hits a woman. Um, that's going to happen everywhere. You know, so if I start thinking it's only going to happen in a certain sector, that's an immediate artistic creation, political failure. So I don't think I should ever. Um, I think it's all about um, making sure that there's an irony. You're talking about the edge. You know, you go to the core of the city, and that's where the edge is. It's it's it, it's true. You know, uh, you go into the centre of the city, and that's where you would have thought it'd be out in the periphery, and it's there too. But so you know, the edge of the city is in the centre of the city, and um, I think if we, you know, as political people, or as, as, as whatever, as, as members of the Labour Party, I'm sure you are, a, a great task would be to. Um, uh, what would you say, make sure that everybody in that inner city edge and on the other edges of the city are included in the definition of Irishness 
And a big part of that definition is how we express ourselves artistically, you know? But I don't personally, I, I, I've never sat down and thought, you know, how can I write something that would be inclusive? Because I think, I think it's, it might be well-intentioned, but it'd probably be an artistic disaster. Yeah, but I think what you did just mention, and maybe that's the question, is about things that we hold in common in our human experience that then have that universality that somebody gets yeah, hit, I mean, hit anywhere. I think it's, it's, we can be too parochial as well. I mean, when I, when, when I, I published a commitment myself with a friend of mine at first, and I remember the first review I ever read, it said it'd be no interest to anybody outside Dublin. And I have an edition in Hebrew at home, you know, and in Korean, and you know, I'm not sure if anybody ever read them, but they're there. So I think, you know, if you think in those terms, that uh, if it's well written, it's well written. If it's well achieved on canvas or if it's a good film, it's a good film. It's never going to compete with a Hollywood film, so forget about that. But other people will see it, other people will appreciate it, other people will have made it. And it grows from that, if that makes sense. It does. Feel that. Yeah, I don't know where, where this thought came from, but I suppose just because you're talking about writing, maybe I'm struck at the when we think of the pandemic. Um, Aaron Dothy Roy um, did an incredible lecture quite early on in the pandemic called The Pandemic is a Portal um, and urged us all to think about what we might carry through the portal and what we might be willing to leave behind. And it just struck me all the time through the pandemic watching certain you know, certain new and interesting things happen, you know, under the guise of the pandemic, we saw rent freezes and things happen in social society that everyone said could never happen. And, you know, and so new social solidarities were, you know, emerged. And so I think, I think it's, it's, it's worth us looking at what, what actually did happen and what can be held on to. But I suppose, I'm, I'm, yeah, I think the most interesting communities are typically communities where you're, you, you have differences rather than just common shared space, you know, with people. And you could be in community with people who are different. You're, something's working. And so for me, I suppose, yeah, it's always about looking for the shared common, you know, humanity experience, but actually, yeah, being, being interested and curious to explore our differences and finding ways to do that. Because we live in a society that people are very, you know, you're very quick to be judged and picked up and get it wrong. So finding spaces to, to kind of to sit with difference and try to understand that, I think, is, is the, the aim. Yeah. Yeah, and that following on from that, that that getting things wrong <laughs> is something that is is an interesting uh, piece about what I was talking about. If if we're going to have a shared island, if we were doing something um, that connects us again, that balance that you're talking about, because the the, the things that are allowed be said and not be said, that kind of goes back to Robbie's freedom. And Ray, do you want to finish us off? I think we're just yeah, about I, out of time. I, I was just. I was reading um, a writer today, um, Marie Hal, and she has a, a poem or a newly commissioned piece, um, an ode to Stephen Hawkins. And she was talking about how, you know, the, the theory that the galaxies are always shifting apart, but that we were all once interconnected, that we were all part of a whole. And Marie has this lovely line in her poem, for every atom belonging to me as good belongs to you, remember. And I, I just thought, wow, what a, what a lovely kind of bridge for me out of this time of separation and to go through that portal that our own Dirty Roy thinks about with a new sense of connectedness to other people. So folks, perhaps we could have a round of applause for... Um... <laughs> conversation as much as I have in listening and getting to ask questions. I think I could go on all night, but I got a little signal there that we're time. Yeah, unfortunately we had to give a little signal. You know the, the best conversation